We're glad you're here. And I'm thrilled to have the chance to talk to you about the story behind Corral and where we want to take it in the future. So we have all met at least one person in our lives whose story seems completely hopeless. You learn what has happened to them and you doubt that there will ever be whole again because of the brokenness they've experienced. Can they ever be okay? Can they ever be truly back to normal? Tonight I'm going to tell three such stories. And these are stories that Joy and I know from our firsthand experiences with young women. And these are the stories that are the reason we started Corral. So the first is the story of Roxanne. Joy met Roxanne during her first year teaching in inner city Philadelphia a decade ago. The school was in a neighborhood called Kensington. And if any of you are from that area or if you know, it's better known as the heroin capital of the United States. 85% of Joy's classroom lived under the poverty line. And more disheartening was that there seemed to be no way out, including the education that Joy was offering as a teacher. Parents were absent at best. Very few of their children lived with both biological parents, and at least one of their parents was usually involved in gangs or gang life. And when the parents were called to a parent-teacher conference, for example, Joy tells me that they were completely aloof. They often showed up drunk or high. They did say something to their kid that made it feel like they were or obliging the, the teacher that they were going to try, and the, the parent and, and the child would leave with little hope. So however that angry that might make you at the parent or the situation or the aunt or the uncle or the mother, we can't fault those folks. They were and they are a product of the same system, all of them. A system raised on Fanta Orange and Cheetos for breakfast, as Joy reports, on MTV and reality TV like Jersey Shore instead of homework, raised by public schools that are staffed with educators that don't actually believe in those kids, and an education that they receive that prepares them for a little more than life on the street. So young boys in that neighborhood believe that their ticket out is the NFL, and young girls, reported by Joy and, and experienced by me, often yearn for a baby. They think that a baby would be a companion that they think can provide them with the unconditional love that they are missing so badly. So it is in this neighborhood that we meet Roxanne. As a sixth grader, Roxanne was everything the name embodies. She was a second generation immigrant from the Dominican Republic. She called herself Rican and she had huge gold hoop earrings. She smacked her gum. She had her dark black hair dyed blonde and she spent most of the first weeks in Joy's classroom cussing out my wife as she taught her. However, the consecutive lunch detentions that resulted from swearing at your teacher in front of your classmates um, became the basis for a mentoring relationship that Joy struck up with Roxanne. She began to trust, Roxanne did, that she could actually learn her math, she could succeed on her morning worksheets, and each time that she chatted with Joy, they built a relationship, and eventually she reached out to Joy for, hope, for advice on girls and life drama and all the things that keep a sixth grader up at night. In that context, one day, Roxanne shared the unthinkable, and she disclosed to Joy that she had been raped. The aggressor was a 35-year-old relative. Her disclosure was quite casual, but more disturbing was that she said it's no big deal, it doesn't really matter. And there's no adequate response in this situation. What do you say? Joy didn't have one. She had no idea, however, at the time that God was preparing her to hear this story multiple more times over the course of her professional career. So the following year, Roxanne was back, this time a seventh grader. She was pregnant. She had begun to buy into the ideas, however, that Joy had tried to put into her head that she could learn, she was smart, and her education was important. But after she had her baby that summer, came back in eighth grade, the level of try had evaporated. She was hanging out with the wrong kids and she basically had given up. <laughs> we didn't blame her. There was no good answer for Roxanne and no system, no program that could fix all that was wrong for her in her life. We were angry, angry at the privileged in Metro Philadelphia for turning what we thought was a blind eye to Kensington and Fishtown and Roxanne, angry at the politicians who chose to get reelected instead of the hard work of fixing the education system, angry at the families who allowed injustice like this to persist. 
But what is most infuriating is that there are no good solutions. Joy pursued teaching as her first job because she thought the education system was broken. And what we found instead were broken communities filled with broken families and broken individuals in those families with broken hearts. Families who lack adequate resources, as many of you know, are prone to abuse, they're prone to trauma, neglect, and ultimately prone to hurt, and a lot of it. So as you may know, abuse and the hurt that comes with it is much more prevalent in neighborhoods like Fishtown. So stick with me tonight. It's a heavy open to the talk, and I, I promise you that we will end on a hopeful note, but I'm going to tell you a few more stories. So what we learned in Philadelphia, and what we have come to believe is really going on, and why we built Corral is to address that individuals have been hurt like Roxanne. And the concept is that, that they're hurt as children. They carry that deep hurt and those deep scars into adult life and sometimes pass those scars to their children. Often, they do. Their children will likely experience the same set of issues, and this is a cycle. It's not a cycle of poverty, per se. It's not an institutional racism cycle, in our opinion wasn't even necessarily a broken educational system, but instead it's pain and hurt. Babies like Roxanne, whose trauma is so significant that research shows it actually rewires their brain. And before they are able to appropriately heal and realize that these children of God are deserving of better, they have their own kids and repeat the cycle with their own situations, just like Roxanne. So, flash forward. October 29th, 2010, it's about five years ago, now in North Carolina, Joy and I are recently married, and we want to tell you the story of another girl, not too dissimilar from Roxanne. She disclosed to Corral her violent story of abuse, and her name is Danley, and this is her story. I think I realized stuff was wrong when I was around, really mainly in my elementary school, because I was kind of violent and I tend to get bullied, be bullied, um, be a bully. But I think by the time I was 12, I was really kind of acting out, starting arguments with my mom, like pulling knives out on my family. <laughs> crazy stuff. <laughs> Outside of school, I was hanging around with gang members, older guys, um, friends my age, but they were doing everything I was, so, and worse. Gang life led me getting in trouble with the law, getting raped, getting, I don't know, in situations I should have never had to go through. Those guys were men that preyed on younger girls. They were all like 21, 22, some even up to 30. But um, I thought that's where I wanted to be. That's where I thought I felt accepted at. The first time I ran away from home, I ran away with a guy who said I could stay with him. He like kept me in a room for a week. He raped me. Second thing that happened, I ran away. I was at a party. I was like at the point where I couldn't like stand up and all of a sudden I see the lights turn off and one of the guys got on top of me. I tried to push him off. I felt a gun pressed up to my mouth so I just took it. And the third time um, I went to a house party and two guys started kind of filling up on me and I was just kind of like flirting, pushing them away, like stop. Then they ended up holding me down and punching me, it's like they wanted to hurt me. Yeah, so they held me down. The first one did it, then they held me down and started bringing random old men in the room. I guess they were like making money off of it. I'm pretty sure that's what they were doing. Brokenness like Danley has experienced doesn't happen in a vacuum. 
It's part of the cycle of hurt that I mentioned earlier before. Danley was the product of an environment where abuse passed through her family tree like a genetic trait, like high blood pressure or high cholesterol. Danley was abused physically and emotionally by her father from the age of two. A church-going man, he justified the abuse under the banner of God. This was perhaps not surprising because her father had been abused in turn by his father, Granley, Danley's granddad. And on her mom's side, Danley's mom grew up with an alcoholic father. And so it was clearly a cycle in their family. When Danley came to us, she was living in a group home because her home had become so unstable. As you heard her mention, perhaps she was pulling a knife out of the drawer and terrorizing her mom. As a 14-year-old, she told Corral that her only hope in life was to have a baby. Her GPA was 1.3, she had a revolving door of boyfriends, and she was doing anything she could to cover the hurt that she felt. This is not a cycle of alcoholism or racism or poverty. This is a cycle of hurt. No system, no program, no government handout can end the cycle of hurt. And unfortunately, feeling compassion on that situation alone is not enough. So Danley first opened up and disclosed the violent story you heard to Joy and the staff at Corral. She didn't tell her own mom, but she disclosed to the staff at Corral what she was going through. And we were thankful Corral was there that day. You see, young women are initiated into a gang through rape. They are promised safety and that someone will have their back. They're yearning for acceptance. But instead, they are locked into a membership of a group that traffics women and uses them as a resource for bartering within the gang. There is no safety, and what's worse, they are threatened that if they try to leave, they'll be hurt or killed. When Danley told us this tragic story, we were instantly entangled in an impossible situation. Many of you may know that Corral is a mandated reporter, so if abuse like this is disclosed or crimes like this are disclosed, we have to report that to the authorities. But you also may know that Danley believed her life would be in danger if he, she reported because rats are treated with violence in the gang that she was in. So we spent the weekend on the phone with Raleigh Police Department, Special Victims Unit, trying to find a place where Danley could be safe and also report what had been done to her, and we could find no such place in Wake County. So at the time, Joy and I felt we had no choice, and we took Danley into our apartment and let her live with us. We were waiting for a spot to open with our partner organization, which is called House of Hope in Clayton. It's a wonderful place, but they didn't have any beds, and so Danley lived with us. She lived with us for 94 days. During that time, the pressure on my young wife and our young marriage was intense. And as you most of you know, and we saw today, when it rains, it pours. So the night before Danley moved in, one of the teen volunteers at Corral showed up on our doorstep after an altercation with her family. So we talked her through that. And the next morning, Joy had her routine annual physical where she went in and was told, surprise, um, that she was pregnant with our first child. This is an hour before she was to pick up Danley. So that was a surprising pregnancy that Joy met with fear and that she needed me to support. We have a wonderful daughter now, but at the time it was, it was a little bit much. And by the end of that weekend, Corral's only employee at the time, who was Joy's right-hand woman, had a breakdown, emotional, emotional and mental breakdown, and she eventually uh, would leave the staff and left us needing help. So over the next few weeks, I found myself in hospital waiting rooms, on the phone with police in the middle of the night, witnessing drug overdoses, and helping Joy dismiss her employee in a, what we hoped was a supportive manner when Corral needed her most. This was an intense time. And what's more, over all of this, Joy was really sick. She had in her first trimester a sickness, an intense form of morning sickness called hyperenesis gravardium, or HG completely unable to eat or drink anything. And I was holding her hair back multiple times a day while Danley was living with us and watching from the other room. And at the end of the first trimester, which was when Joy moved out, or Danley moved out, excuse me, Joy had lost 15 pounds. So the timing of Danley's need could not have been worse. But even through all that, she found a way to be encouraged. So shortly after Christmas, she'd been with us two months, we start to see a change. At the time, the only DVD I owned, that was before Netflix, thank you, um, the only DVD I owned that I thought a teenager would like was The Green Mile, which is a movie with Tom Hanks that some of you may know. So we watched that with Danley twice because it was the only thing I had. 
And afterwards, one night, she interrupted me as we were going to bed, and she said, Rob, how do you pray? So Joy and I stayed up with her until midnight that night, talking about our Father God and his love for her. Additionally, when she was with us, she read the first book she'd read in a few years because she hated to read. But Joy handed her a copy of a book called Redeeming Love, which some of you may have read. It's an allegory to the biblical book of Hosea, which talks about how our Lord pursues his children relentlessly, no matter how many times they turn their back on him. So that book is 500 pages long, and Danley read it in four days. So the morning she left, day number 94, she left a note on Joy's pillow that said the following. Dear Miss Joy, you guys are like family to me. You're the only person that I look up to 100%. I've learned so much from you. You have really showed me what love is. You've taught me so much about myself and helped me realize that I have the potential to do whatever I want in life. You help me to understand that I do need God in my life and I can't do everything alone. I can see God is working in my life because he sent you to help me in my time of need. Thank you for never giving up on me. I promise I'll always remember that I have tons of people and eight horses at Corral that love and support me. So even with this glimpse of redemption, what our young, entrepreneurial, save-the-world minds didn't understand was that we could not single-handedly bear, bear this cross. Danley returned to parties and gangs after her time at House of Hope, unfortunately. I was devastated when I learned that our personal sacrifice didn't save her from the pain. So Joy and I weren't able, able to single-handedly end the cycle of hurt, and we weren't the Savior. The good news is that the whole experience transformed what Corral is today, and I'm happy to tell you about that. What Joy and I learned through this time was that the success or failure of a young woman in Corral isn't dependent upon one single person. After Danley left, Joy's HG, or hyperemesis, continued for another six months, and she was basically incapacitated. And during her illness, a whole army of people rose up to carry the torch. Brilliant new staff stepped in to fill the roles we needed on our staff. Dedicated volunteers committed weekly to tu tutoring and teaching. And talented mental health professionals and therapists covered the emotional and behavioral needs of the girls. And pretty soon, a whole community surrounded the young women of Corral. And a lot of that community is represented in the room tonight. So it was no longer Rob and Joy's Corral, even though you might think it is tonight because we're up here. Um, but quite to the contrary, it was our community's corral, and we really started to see success. We now believe it really does take a village to raise a child, and you are that village. None of us can carry this burden alone. That is clear. Not only will it burn through our personal resolve as individuals, but it will destroy our lives. The 94 days I lived with Danley crushed my wife Joy and stressed our family to the, to the limit. So if you leave tonight and you think, man, that sure is nice what that couple is doing in Cary. I really hope we can support them. You will have missed my point completely. I will have not painted the appropriate picture of how important it is that we band together to provide a solution that can end the cycle of hurt for each and every young woman in Wake County and in our community. As a team, we can come together to provide wraparound services to meet the emotional, academic, social, vocational, and spiritual needs of the girls we serve. And that is what Corral is organized to do in a very strategic and very intentional manner. So many of you have already come forward with your gifts, with your time and your talents as tutors, teachers, equestrians, prayer warriors, business leaders that have supported the young women and provide the kind of support they need to pull themselves up by the bootstraps and onto a more healthy place over the long term breaking the cycle of pain. So thank you. But many of the girls, not but, as a result, many of the girls at Corral say that Corral is a place where they really feel at home, where they can finally breathe, and where they are accepted and when they learn, where they learn their true resolve. Thank you. Together we have achieved and we are starting to achieve outcomes that are noteworthy. Let me read some of them to you. So once they enroll, None of the Corral girls have had any further or any new court complaints with the Wake County Juvenile Court, both while they're in the program and a year after they leave. 85% of the 
of the girls that come to Corral, attend school with almost perfect attendance. And these are girls that skipped 30 and 40 days in the marking periods before they arrive at Corral. 85% show a reduction in behavioral incidents like the pink slips that Roxanne was getting in Joy's class. And 75% have shown an increase in both grade point average and emotional intelligence. And encouragingly, thanks to our dedicated staff and tutors and volunteers, at the end of the last school year, all of the Corral girls were passing their core classes in school. 93% were passing with C's or better. So thank you. These stats are amazing, and these outcomes are encouraging, but what's re what really is amazing and what I really want to imbue into you tonight is that we are changing the trajectories of lives we touch as a Corral community. I want to show you one more video that talks about that. In ninth grade, she started having anxiety and panic attacks and was having issues going to school. Some days I could get her to go, some days it was just I'd get in the parking lot and she would not get out of the car. We started seeing a big change in her. She had dyed her hair, she had put gauges in her ears, and she just was very angry. She had a wall of anxiety, depression, and she just wanted to crawl up in the bed. And her dad and I knew that we would have to do something. So we came out and interviewed for Corral. And the lady asked us, what was our main concern? And when you go through reading a diary about how someone doesn't want to be around, how hurt they are, the color of the hair doesn't matter. All that matters is saving that child. She's gone from F's to A's and B's. And the teachers will ask me, what did you do? This isn't the same girl. Her hair is naturally blonde. It's blonde again. The gauges are gone. She's happy. She's smiling. She's going to graduate on time. And she's talking about going to college. She wants to come back and help a program like Corral. That one is always hard for me to watch. So that was Marilyn, and together, the Corral community has changed the trajectory of Marilyn's life. At Corral, she learned she was loved, that she could still love, and that she's capable. She's developed friends and learned to rely upon others for support, not the gangs that Danley looked to. And most importantly, she has learned that she is loved and cherished by the Most High God, who has mighty plans for her. So seven years into Corral, and largely due to the lessons we learned dealing with Danley's situation and a dozen more like it, we are changing trajectories. We are turning desperate situations into precious futures. And we are seeing redemption like Maryland's happen right before our eyes. Praise God. The same thing eventually happened for Danley. Even though her story so far might sound like the cycle of hurt has not been broken, the chapter she is writing now would suggest otherwise. I'm encouraged to tell you about it. As I mentioned, Danley returned back to gang life and prostitution. She dropped out of high school when she was 19. She briefly married a man who physically and emotionally abused her and who was gang involved. And she became pregnant with his son. But as she was starting down that path, the light bulb went off for her. She realized, resolved to herself, and put in place a plan that the cycle of hurt would end. She, is now, she was now in charge of a precious baby, and she cut ties with her gang-involved husband. She decided that she would not allow a father like the one she had to be involved in her son's life. She left the gang, even given the risk involved in doing so that I mentioned earlier, and she restored her relationship with her mother. She finished her GED and started college. She wanted something more for her baby. So when she gave that interview a few weeks ago, she told us that she knows she made these changes in the end because of the life she saw was possible when she was at Corral. At Corral, she learned that she was capable of anything. And if she worked hard, she could achieve it all. Importantly, 
she also learned that as a woman, she was a child of God and no man should treat her disrespectfully. As she described it, she said the following, quote, I saw you and Joy and the others at Corral, and I knew there were men out there that would respect me and love me, and I wanted that for me and my son. Danley will be finishing her associate's degree this spring in medical business administration. Because of Corral, Danley's son will not be hurt by his father. Because of Corral, he will not be indoctrinated into gangs, and he will be raised by a strong mother who believes the best for her child a stark contrast to the home she was raised in. So God worked through a terribly difficult situation with Danley, but because of the work he did through all of you at Corral, the cycle of hurt has been broken. So to invest in Corral means to invest in changing the outcome of a life that is destined for hurt or heartache, dependency, abuse, Poverty, or even worse, as Marilyn's mom referenced, suicide. There is much more work to be done at Corral, and we need you, Corral's village, to join us and continue the momentum we are building as a community. You see, a new face showed up at Corral two weeks ago. Her name is Erica. She is also a victim of abuse, and her story is similar. She relies on manipulation to get what she wants, and to cover the hurt she feels so deep inside. So Danley's story is five years old, and Erica's is just starting. But you and the others at Corral are ready to help, and I look forward with encouragement to the wonderful healing that may take place through the community of you all at Corral. Over the next year, there will be 50 or 60 more, just like Erica, that show up on our doorstep. And tonight is about getting you all involved in breaking those cycles of hurt and changing the trajectories of those lives. So at this time, what I would like to do is ask the folks who have a name tag on, you think you're special. Um, if you'd stand up for me, that would be great. You're not special. <laughs> but the folks that are standing represent only a portion of the village at Corral. They are our staff, our volunteers, our board members, and we didn't give out enough name tags because many of you deserve them and more would stand. But this is the village. They have made a decision to invest in the future of the girls significantly. And we ask you tonight to join them. We hope you will. We want you to stand with us. Stand with this group of people. The work is hard, but it's certainly worth it. And please consider partnering with us tonight and investing in Corral. Thank you. The, you can be seated. As I close, it's important to understand that any investment in Corral is an investment for the long term. You can have this long term perspective for two reasons tonight. First, your investment will break generational cycles and change the trajectories of lives. These are decidedly long term effects that will change entire family trees. So think of it as a long term investment in Corral. And second, you should also have this perspective at this year's dinner in particular due to the unique place we find ourselves in Corral's history. I'm happy to report that we kicked off a capital campaign this spring, which Corral is calling our Forever Home Campaign. Our fundraising goal is ambitious, but we aim to raise by the end of the year $1 million to buy the farm that we currently rent. It's ambitious but attainable, and we hope that it will allow us to create a forever home in Wake County, to set deep roots in Wake County to fulfill the mission for generations to come. So tonight, as you consider how you can give and serve Corral, I encourage you to think about it, your investment as an impact investment, one that's for the long term, a forever kind of investment. And I encourage you to stretch and give beyond what you might normally consider giving at tonight's dinner, because any stretch gift will be about much more than just meeting our operational budget for the year, but will be about endowing Corral for forever, for the forever home that will serve hurting young women like Roxanne, Danley, Marilyn, Erica, and so many more for years to come. So would you consider, please, stretching along with the people you saw stand, stretching along with us to make Corral a forever solution for changing the trajectories of lives of hurting young women. Please do. The next Danley is quite literally on her way to the farm. 
And so I ask tonight that you would invest in her redemption along with the rest of us. Thank you very much.